A Kitten in Paradise, written by Cicely Hamilton. Taken from the anthology Puss in Books. Copyright 1932 by Dodd, Mead, and Company, New York. Edited by Elizabeth Drew and Michael Joseph. Read by Phoebe Phillips. Once upon a time, there lived in a thoroughly disreputable street, a thoroughly disreputable man. That is to say, he lived there when he was not in Gal, for he went very often and deserved to go very much oftener. In the prison he was supported by the taxpayer's money, and out of prison he supported himself by annexing other people's property. In fact, he stole so much and so often that if he had not wasted the proceeds in drink, he ought to have been quite well off. It happened one day as he was returning home from a neighboring public that he leaned against a lamp post till the street grew a little more steady, and as he stood embracing the stem of the lamp post, he heard a plaintive noise at his feet. It was the cry for help of a kitten, strayed and hungry, a small shabby kitten, very young and inexperienced. Otherwise, it would hardly have appealed for help to anyone so unprepossessing as the drunken, disreputable thief. The drunken thief was in the foolish, cheerful stage of intoxication, so the kitten's plaintive crying amused him. Hello, he said. And what have you got to grass about? Got a thirst on your air? And the pub's all shut. Uh, perhaps they've turned you out of your pub. Same as they turned me last night. The idea amused him so much that he picked up the kitten and stuffed it in his dirty pocket. The Paradise of Cats, written by Emil Zola in 1864. Narrated by Phoebe Phillips. An aunt bequeathed me an Angora cat, which is certainly the most stupid animal I know of. This is what my cat related to me one winter night before the warm embers. I was then only two years old, and I was certainly the fattest and most simple cat anyone could have seen. Even at that tender age, I displayed all the presumptions of an animal that scorns the attractions of the fireside. And yet, what gratitude I owed to Providence for having placed me with your aunt. The worthy woman idolized me. I had a regular bedroom at the bottom of the cupboard with a feather pillow and a triple-folded rug. The food was as good as the bed. No bread or soup. Nothing but meat. Good, underdone meat. Well, amidst all these comforts, I had but one wish, but one dream, to slip out the half-open window and run away on to the tiles. Caresses appeared to me insipid. The softness of my bed disgusted me. I was so fat that I felt sick. And from morn till eve, I experienced the weariness of being happy. A Cat May Look at a King Written by Jen Struther in the late 1920s or early 1930s Read by Phoebe Phillips The court cat lay curled up in a corner of the stone terrace with his tail round his nose and his warm furry body bruising a bed of sweet-smelling thyme. The scent of the thyme and the heat of the sun and the murmur of velvet bees all around seemed to weave themselves into a threefold symphony of perfume, warmth, and sound, more divine than any human music. The court cat drowsed in an ecstasy and found the world good. True, he was only a very humble member of the royal household, and nobody treated him with respect 
or even with much kindness. Kicks were often his lot, but he had plenty of happens, too, in the form of fresh milk and goldfish, given to him secretly by the smallest scullery maid. Secretly because such delicacies were supposed to spoil his appetite for rats and mice. The ladies of the court were gracious to him in their way, but they never made a pet of him. Oh, no, he was not, by any means, a society animal, merely a plain, dark, short-haired tabby with enormous yellow eyes, and no one except the smallest scullery maid. The Fat Cat, written by Q. Patrick in 1959, narrated by Phoebe Phillips. The Marines found her when they finally captured the old mission house at Fufa. After two days of relentless pounding, they hadn't expected to find anything alive there, least of all, a fat cat. And she was a very fat cat. Sandy is a Scotsman with enormous agate eyes and a fat, amiable face. She sat there on the mat, or rather, what was left of the mat, in front of what had been the mission porch, licking her paws as placidly as if the shell-blasted jungle were a summer lawn in New Jersey. One of the men, remembering his childhood primer, quoted, The fat cat sat on the mat. The other men laughed, not that the remark was really funny, but laughter broke the tension and expressed their relief at having last reached their objective after two days of bitter fighting. The fat cat, still sitting on the mat, smiled at them, as if to show she didn't mind the joke being on her. Then she saw Corporal Randy Jones, and for some reason, known only to herself, ran toward him as though he was her long-lost master. With a refrigerator purr, she weaved in and out of his muddy legs. Everyone laughed again as Randy picked her up and pushed his ugly face against the sleek fur.